Welcome to Westside Community Church. You're watching a message series by Pastor John Clark titled, One of Us is in Trouble. This is part two. Let's join Pastor John now as he begins. If you got your Bibles, take them and turn with me to John chapter uh, 20, verses 24 through 28. In John chapter 20, I'm, I'm talking today um, on part two of One of Us is in Trouble. And, um, and what I want to do is pick up where we left off last week. Now, I know what's going to happen. That's going to be some trouble for us because if you weren't with us last Sunday, you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to be missing just a small piece. But, but two things I talked about last Sunday that were critical for you and I to know was one, that there was the power of one. Jesus has come back for his disciples. He's resurrected from the dead. And when he arrives, uh, the disciples are scared. They're locked in a room. And, and, and he comes back and Thomas is missing. Thomas was not with them. And so, so when he returns... There is this dilemma, this difficulty with grappling with how to handle it that he came back for all of his disciples, not just some of them. Thomas was missing. And we talked about the power of one. Remember, we talked about everything God ever did, he did through one, right? He created humanity through one man, Adam. He, he started a nation through one man, Abraham. He, he, he led the children of Israel out of captivity through one man, Moses. And Jesus sat on a well all day long waiting for one woman because he knew that she was a change breaker and, 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 and she was able to break the curse so he waits for one. It was what he did when he raised Lazarus from the dead. It was just one. It was Bartimaeus alongside the road. It was one. Jesus will do it for one. He'll come back again for one. So we talked about that last week. So today we're going to pick up John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. I'm going to read the scripture for you. And, and then I'm just going to share um, a, a few things that I think are important. And then I really want to land on one thing. And I promise you we'll be out before the top of the hour. But... Um, here it goes. Read with me. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. It says, Now Thomas called Didymus. Uh, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. Verse 25, The other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas missed the meeting, and the disciples went back and said, Dude, you missed the most amazing thing in the world. So Thomas said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of those nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's amazing what it will take for someone to believe. Thomas wanted physical proof. Verse 26, and after eight days. Now I'm reading from the New King James Version because if you have the NIV, which I re usually read from, it is not accurate in its uh, understanding and dissertation of the Greek. It says in your version about a week later, but the reality is in the Greek it was after eight days. That's critical, critical. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. They they, they're still locked in this room. Jesus appeared to them. He leaves. Eight, day late, eight days later, Jesus comes back, and they're still locked in the same room. And Thomas now was with them. The missing disciple has joined them. And Jesus came, the doors being locked, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. I talked last week about Jesus just showed up. He didn't open the door. He didn't come through the window. He didn't ring the doorbell. He just shows up. And I talked to you that Jesus will just show up for you. No matter where you're locked away at, no matter what room you are in, no matter how much the shades have been drawn, no matter how long you've been locked away, Jesus will show up in the midst of it. Verse 27, then Jesus said to Thomas, reach your finger in here and look at my hands and reach your hand into here and put it into my side. Stop doubting, Jesus says, and believe. And then verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. We're going to talk today about what happened to Thomas and why he was missing before and now why he's here. And maybe you'll identify in your own life that. So what I want you to do is this. I want to make sure you're interactive with me and you stay with me. So I need you to, I need you to help me uh, with audience participation for a moment. Um, you, ever, you ever have somebody say to you, let's get real? You ever, you ever have somebody like that? They say, well, you know, it's time to get real. Let's get down to brass tacks. It's time for you and I to be honest. You, are you familiar with those phrases, right? I like the phrase, let's get real. Because when we get real, then, 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 then there's this honest exchange. And so um, what I want you to do is in preparation for that, I, I want you to repeat something out loud. It's going to be um, your statement of belief, all right? We're going to call it your statement of belief. Uh, you don't have to say it if you don't want to say it, but we'll stare at you if you don't, okay? So uh, that's all right. All right, good. So I'm not going to make you stand. I just want you to repeat after me if you want to. Um, and, and the phrase is simple. We're, we're, and I'll, I'll give it to you first, then I'll give it to you in parts. We're going to say um, uh, something to this effect. I am ready to get real with myself. Okay? That's what we're going to say. I am ready to get real 
with myself. We're going we're gonna to get real. So you ready? Uh, uh, on the count of three, I'll give you a phrase, and then you repeat it back, and then I'll give you the next one. And then we're going to pray, all right? You ready? So, I am ready. I am it's not bad. If we were at a funeral, that is lovely. Okay, so it's, because I, I don't feel like you're, you're convinced, because convinced people, you know, shout things. I watched Braveheart on Thursday night. I mean, you can't watch Braveheart uh, and not be excited. So, I am ready. I am ready. Nice. Ah, to get real. To get real. With myself. Try it again. I am ready, I am ready. To, get real to get real with myself. With myself. Now, don't blame me in about 25 minutes when what happens, happens, okay? Because you asked for it. All right, so let's pray. <laughs> God, you're amazing. I love you, and I love your word. Release your spirit today, God. Help us to be captivated by you in the power of you, Lord. May we recognize that it is you, Jesus, and you alone. You're all we need. May we get it together. May we come together. May we be real today because we're ready to be real with ourselves. May your Holy Spirit speak. I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, let, let's just look at the scripture. Let's break it down. John chapter 20. I, I want to look at verse 26 first, okay? There's a few things that really jumped out at me when I was studying the scripture. And the first it says, and after eight days, Jesus came back. After eight days, he came back. He came back for an encore performance. Do you remember, if you read your Bibles, the same thing he did before he does this time. The disciples are in a room with the doors locked, shades are drawn, Jesus appears to them. He finds out Thomas is not there. He says, I'll be back. And then Jesus leaves. He comes back. The room is still the same. The disciples are there. The doors are locked. The shades are drawn. But Thomas is now here. Jesus comes back and does an encore performance for an audience of one. He comes back because Thomas was missing before. Aren't you glad to know that Jesus will come back for you? Aren't you glad to know that he'll come back for you again and again and again until you get it right? I love that about my God. And it does not matter the size of the audience. He'll do it just for one. You see, I preach my guts out every Sunday here, right? And, and let's say that, that you missed the service and I was getting in my truck and get ready to leave today and you ran up and said, Pastor, Pastor, I, I missed the service. Could you do it again for me? No, okay? That's why God made the internet so you can watch it online. No, I would probably, I would probably do it. Probably do it for fear that I get struck by lightning. But anyways, <laughs> Jesus came back. For one, he, he did an encore performance. I, I love that about my God, but, but that's not the part that amazes me the most. It says, and after eight days. When, when, I, when I began to, to do some study, I began to realize there's something to that, Right? You know, the number eight, uh, if, you, if, you, if you understand numbers, is, is uh, the number for new beginnings, okay? It's the beginning of a new week. And I, I thought, you know, because you and I both know, we studied scripture together, right? For over the years. Anytime there's a date, a place, or a name given, it matters in scripture. Don't think it's just a name to fill in space. He says, after eight days. So I thought, well, maybe Jesus is signifying that he's coming back uh, to do something new, a new beginning, and then as I studied a little bit more, I began to realize there are some similarities in Scripture when you use this number eight days, when you talk about it this way. And then I remembered that in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, the mother of Jesus, Mary, and his father Joseph take Jesus when he's eight days old. They take the baby Jesus to the temple, and there Simeon, the high priest, is about to perform a circumcision according to the Levitical law that when a baby is eight days old, it shall be circumcised. And circumcision, for those of us who are not uncomfortable enough yet, I'll explain it further without detail, but I'll explain to you that a circumcision is literally the cutting away of the flesh. It is, it is cutting away the flesh that holds us back and does not allow the spirit to go forward. And so, so it was after eight days that Jesus comes back to his disciples because I believe he was preparing to cut away the flesh. He was about to circumcise the disciples, spiritually speaking, and prepare them and say, listen, the flesh is out of control. We're going to get this under control today. We're going to cut some things away. I hope today that God will do that for you. I hope that some things that have been holding you back will be cut away and will drop to the floor and you will be released in the spirit to do what God has called you to do. God's called you to do some great things and you cannot do it if you're being held back by the flesh. I believe too much of how we operate in our daily lives is flesh driven that ends today. Does it not? Does it not end today? Okay, I, I got 35% I got of you convinced. The rest of you aren't convinced. I'm coming out there. 
I may not have much of a voice to stay all day, but I will if I have to. Let me convince you this. Let me, let me go on one further. I, I want to look at another part. The, the Bible says in verse, what I believe is 25, an interesting uh, exchange here, verse 25, Thomas says, unless um, I see the holes in his hands, and, and, and unless I can put my finger in the hole and my hand into his side, I will not believe. When Thomas says this, Thomas says it in private. The disciples came to him and said, we've seen the Lord. And he responds in verse 25 with, unless I get to do this, I will not believe. It was in private. But now look at verse 27. Verse 27 says, when Jesus arrived in the room, he doesn't speak to John, who loves him. He doesn't talk to Peter, who's pretty much the, 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 the anointed uh, leader of the group. He goes right to Thomas. And he says to Thomas, come here, son. Look at the holes in my hands. Thomas, put your finger right in here. Thomas, your hand fits perfectly into my side. He goes right to Thomas. Interesting, right? Thomas said it privately, and yet Jesus addresses it with him publicly. We well, see, what, what happens is what Thomas was not aware of, what Thomas wasn't aware of, and maybe you're not aware of, is that you can, you can, uh, you, you, you can think Jesus was not there, but he is there. You can assume today he's not here, but, but he is here. You, you, you didn't see him in the room, but he was in the room, because the Bible tells me that Jesus is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. He is, he is um, omniscient, which means all-knowing, and he's omnipresent. He can be all places at all times. Jesus was there, whether or not Thomas knew it. I love that Jesus walks up to him and, and, and says, here, if you, if you need to see it for yourself, go ahead, look at the holes. Go ahead and put your finger in it, boy, if you have to. This is where the spear went in. Go ahead and put your hand there. Thomas, the Bible says, fell to his knees, and he said, my Lord and my God. I, I'm going to come back to those um, five words at the end, but they're critical. He says, my Lord and my God. See, he saw in Jesus that he was the one. Thomas was getting it together, and I, I, I can't talk to you about that now. I'll come back to it in a moment. I want to look at one more thing. It, it's back in verse 27, I believe. Jesus says to Thomas, remember when this exchange is happening, he says, stop doubting and believe. Now, now what's interesting to me, and, and those of you who have been in church enough years, you know that, that we call Thomas what? What is, what is Thomas's, uh, what do we call him? Doubting Thomas. Isn't that funny? You all know that. Even if you weren't raised in church, you know that we call him Doubting Thomas. Can, can, I, can I tell you, I've done a track record study of Thomas. He's not a doubter, okay? It, what's amazing is Thomas doubted this one time when he said, I will not believe unless I, unless I touch him. But, but, but there was only one other opportunity I see where he even began to question, isn't it amazing that people will call us by something that we did one time and it sticks with us? People will define you by the way they met you. People will define you by one moment, by one mistake, by one event. Something happened and now all of a sudden it's Doubting Thomas we call him. It's just not Thomas, he's a doubter. Aren't you glad to know, and, and I am for sure, that, that Jesus does not judge us based on one moment, but he judges on the totality of our lives. So in the end, when it gets there, he doesn't look at the one time you failed or the mistake you made or, or the event that you were part of or what you said or what you did not do, but he takes the totality. He'll judge me based on that. I'm so glad to know we have a Savior that loves us at those levels. Here's the deal. People will judge you for 30 years for what happened in 30 minutes, but it ends because Jesus says, don't worry about what man says. Worry about what I say. I love that about my Lord. He says, stop doubting, Thomas and believe. I, I, I'll explain more about that too in just a moment. So all of that that I just gave you in the last six minutes was not what I want to preach about today. <laughs> that was just a prelude. Don't you hate that when you hear from the pastor? You're like, dude, that was pretty good. We could go now, right? Let me talk to you about um, the one thing I really believe God wants you to hear today. Go back to verse 24 of John chapter 20. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, the scripture says. If you don't get this, you will not understand what I believe God wants to talk to us about today. It says, now Thomas called Didymus. If, if you don't understand the, the term Didymus, they called him Didymus. Didymus in the Greek means twin. So they were calling Thomas the twin. And, and, and why that's so important for you and I to understand is it doesn't say that Thomas had a twin. It doesn't say that Thomas was a twin. It says that they called him the twin. It's his nickname, right? I mean, this is what they call him. And you only get a nickname if you've done something to get a nickname. I got a nickname. 
most of you don't even know it. I'm a little embarrassed to even share it with you today. But it's true, I do. Um, and, and, and only those who really understand it, maybe a dozen people in the known world, even know my nickname. It happened on November 14th, about 10 years ago. I know it was that because it was the evening before one of the great holidays in northern Michigan, which is deer hunting season, right? <laughs> the, oh, now I get applause for deer hunting season, but not for Jesus. Okay, I, I know where you're going now. And we were playing cards. It was late at night, and my brother was there and a handful of buddies. And as we were playing cards, my brother told a story, and then he called me Bobby. My given name is John. Just John, J-O-H-N, but my brother called me Bobby. And when he called me Bobby, I said, why are you calling me Bobby? And he began to laugh, and everyone on the table began to laugh. And, and, and I wish I could tell you the rest of the story, but there's some things you can't talk about in church. <laughs> One of them is how I got my nickname Bobby. But someday when we're not here, you ask me, I'll tell you, you'll laugh your pants off. But anyways, <laughs> so he began to call me Bobby. Matter of fact, I have two nephews. My, my brother's two sons call me Uncle Bobby. It's the only name. They've heard my brother call me. He's never called me John since that day. I'm Bobby. To make things interesting, I call him Bobby also. Okay? And that makes the story even more interesting. But it's a nickname, right? Well, well, Thomas has a nickname. His nickname is Didymus, the twin. They call him the twin. And, and when I first read that, I thought, I wonder why that's the case. And then I began to realize that the Apostle Paul spoke of the very same thing. Because, because let me explain this to you first, and I'll talk about what the Apostle Paul said. That, that, that uh, I, I began to do some background on, on, on Thomas. You know, we first hear about Thomas in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3. In Matthew 10, verse 3, it says that Jesus called his disciples, and he called Philip and Bartholomew and Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. Thomas is listed among the disciples. He's right in the middle of the second group. But it doesn't say Thomas called Didymus. So at this point, when Jesus calls him in Matthew 10, he's just still Thomas, his Hebrew given name. Okay? Stay with me. So then I began to do more research, and I discovered the first time Thomas was ever called Didymus, the twin, was when, in John chapter 11, Jesus is on the other side of the Jordan River with his disciples. They're hiding out, and Jesus gets word that his friend Lazarus is dying. Jesus says, we're going to go to Bethany. The disciples begin to argue with Jesus and say, Jesus, we can't do that, dude. If, if you go through Jerusalem to get to Bethany, they're going to arrest you, and you might die. And it's in this moment that Thomas... Not Peter. Thomas speaks up in John 11, verse 16. Thomas says, let us go with Jesus even if we die. There's, there's, this, there's this passion about Thomas to give it all for Jesus. Let's go with him even if we die. And they went on because of Thomas' encouragement. That's the first time Thomas, called Didymus, is mentioned. They mention it because he's brave and bold. But look what happens. In John chapter 14, Jesus is about to dispel to the disciples... His sole purpose of coming. John chapter 14, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm not a liar, Jesus says. But I go there to prepare you a place. And where I go to prepare you a place, you may be there with me also. Jesus says that. Thomas called Didymus, John 14 verse 5, Thomas called Didymus speaks up. And he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know even how to get there. Where's the guy who was willing to die for Jesus, and now this guy doesn't even know who Jesus is and where he's going? The same cat, just three chapters later, is all of a sudden doesn't even know who Jesus is, to which Jesus responds in verse 6, and he says, Thomas, I am the way, and I am the truth, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. It's almost as though... Jesus was saying to Thomas, dude, what is wrong with you? Where's the guy we had just three chapters ago who wanted to die for me because he knew I had purpose in this world? And now you don't even know that I'm talking about heaven. And I'm the only way you get there. So now do we have an understanding of how they gave him the nickname Thomas, right? The Didymus, the twin. There's two people in operation in Thomas. There's, there's this one cat and another one. one. One guy is bold and the other one is is scared. One guy is, one guy is willing to die for Jesus, and the other guy doesn't even know who Jesus is and where he's going. So, so Paul says in, in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 17, Paul describes it in the spiritual sense of the word. He says, I do not understand what I do, because what I want to do, I don't do, and what I hate to do, I do that. Oh, that I'm a wretched man, that, that I could free myself from myself. For he says that it's the sin in my flesh that rises to the top, but I want the Spirit of God to rise even higher. Paul was expressing 
that there seemed to be this twin in him also. Matter of fact, psychology teaches us that there's a twin, two people in operation in us at all times. Now, some of you just doubted me when I said that, but I'll explain it to you, and I promise you, you'll see it in yourself. Now, there, there's psychology teaches there's two people in operation at all times. There, there's what you call the ideal you, and the ideal you is the one, is the person you, you, uh, you want us to think you are, and the real you. The real you is the one you lay down with at night and you struggle with your insecurities and your inabilities. The ideal you is the one you project for human consumption. And the, uh, and the real you is the one you wrestle with the doubts and the panic and the confusion. The ideal you versus the real you, right? I mean, that's what's really going on here. You know what that looks like, right? The ideal you. The ideal you, you ever had this happen? Somebody who you trusted and you loved stabbed you in the back. The ideal you says when they come to you and say, do you forgive me? The ideal you, because you're a Christian, says, absolutely, brother, I forgive you. It wasn't that big of a deal. And when they walk away, the real you says, and I hope a tree falls on your face and you're mangled for life. <laughs> am I right or am I the only one? Stay with me. I'll give you more. The ideal you, uh, the ideal you says, uh, no, no problem. I'd, I'd be glad to loan you some more money even though you owe me 200. That's the ideal you, but the real you says, if you turn your back, I promise you I'll shoot you dead. That's what the real you says, right? Here, let me give you another one. This is a true story. Some of y'all, have you guys ever been to Gallagher's Farm Market just up the road? Gallagher's Farm Market is blessed by God, okay? Because between Thursday and Sunday, they make this thing called pizza bread. And if you've never had pizza bread from Gallagher's Farm Market, you are missing out on one of the seven wonders of the world. I mean this, I got pizza bread, uh, but anyways, so they only make it on Thursday through Sunday. So on Monday, this is how passionate I am about pizza bread, I swing in. I order two loaves of pizza bread, okay? Just, I'm going to pick them up on Thursday, but I want to get on Monday to make sure they got me my pizza bread. About 5 o'clock on Thursday, I show up to buy my pizza bread. I walk into Gallagher's Farm Market, just a beautiful little place, and there is a gentleman with his about 9-year-old daughter, and they're looking in the, uh, in, the, in the case in front of the registers, looking at the donuts, and they're trying to pick one out. I can tell by their accents they're not from around here. Kind of from Jersey, I think, of that New Jersey East Coast accent. True story. And I walk up, and one of the girls says, can I help you? And she knew who I was. And I said, yeah, I said, I ordered two loaves of pizza bread. And she goes, we have them right here. And she begins to pull them out. They're still on the tray. They're still hot. She's putting them in the bag. And the guy from Jersey says to her, can I try a piece of that pizza bread? To which she says, I'm sorry, sir, he purchased the last two loaves. This guy from Jersey, we're standing three feet apart, says, this guy bought all the pizza bread? And, and, and he's never had it, but now he's ticked at me. I've done nothing but showed up to pay for, okay? That's all I've done. So, so I'm standing there. The little girl, the nine-year-old, without joking, pulls on her daddy's shirt, says, Daddy, are we going to get some pizza bread? And he says, no, this guy bought it all. What have I done? I've done nothing but get what I love, right? And so I'm paying for it. Just then the wife walks up. The only way I know that's hers because they're the size of her hair. But she walks up because <laughs> they're from Jersey. She walks up and she walks up and she says, what's going on? The little girl says, mama, this guy bought all the pizza bread. <laughs> I grab my pizza bread and as I'm walking out, the ideal me, right, walks out and smiles and shrugs my shoulders like, oops, my fault. But the real me wants to turn around and go, that's right, this guy's got all the bread and you got none. So take that back to Jersey. <laughs> See, there's the ideal you, right? And there's the real you. The ideal you is the one that shows up most of the time. But the real you is the one that's buried. There, there's got to come a point when we understand that, that the longer that we allow um, the, the image of us to be promoted and, and, and the more we push back the real us, the, the more there, we're dying inside. You know what the ideal you and real you looks like on Sundays, right? This is what it looks like on Sundays. I know this happened to some of y'all this morning. See, because the ideal you shows up here and says, praise the Lord, Pastor. So good to be in the house of God. That's what you say to me at the front door. But the real you fought with your wife all the way here this morning over spilled milk, right? You spilled the milk. No, you spilled it. It's your kids that spilled the milk. Your kids spilled the milk. Bah, 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 bah. And you walk in, you go, oh, praise Jesus, we're here. <laughs> That's the ideal you who's full of it, but the real you is the one that was fighting. Right? I mean, that's the ideal. You know, there's a guy. I have a problem. There's a guy who, um, who wears my clothes. His feet fit my shoes, and he drives my truck. He looks just like me, uh, but you don't know him. He's my twin, and he's in trouble. See, because 
the, the, there's levels of blessings that I will never experience in the kingdom of God until I get this guy, my twin, up under the control of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. There, there is going to be a time when we're going to have to come to the place where we realize we got to submit ourselves to Him. Absolutely, you ought to applaud God for that because there's the truth of His Word. I still only got like 70% of you. I'm going to keep going then. I'll get you before it's over. Because the reality is this, that, that we're never really going to be free. We're never going to experience all that God has for us if you and I continue to live with one being projected for human consumption and the other being buried in his pain. There is people here this morning who you know nothing about, but you're sitting beside them. There is someone here this morning you're married to, and it's been 20 years, and you still don't know the real you in them because they've never told it. There's the wounded you. There's the angry you. There's the despondent you, the disappointed you, the frustrated you, the lustful you, the liar you, the scared you. It's in all of us, right? There's these two opposing forces that continue to battle back and forth. And until we drag both of them down to the altar and confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and Lord of all, we're going to struggle in this. And, and so the reality is Jesus came back after eight days for Thomas because he came back for the twin. He came back for Didymus. And he'll come back for you this morning. See, I wonder how many of us are struggling with, with these two opposing forces. You, you promote the ideal you, but there's the real you. And the real you is in trouble. See, I believe one of you is in trouble today. I believe one of you is in trouble. You know, it, it's, it's the reason why, right? You, you've seen this before. Watch the news the next time somebody goes on a shooting spree. Somebody takes an automatic weapon into a public school, or they take it into a mall or the office, and they shoot dozens of people. And what happens is this. That night on the news, they'll interview a neighbor or a co-worker of the man who shot all these people. And what does the neighbor or the co-worker say? He says, I just had coffee with him on Tuesday, and he seemed just fine. I didn't see anything wrong with him. I had no idea he was capable of that. A long-distant relative comes on the news and does the interview and says, I just spoke to him on the phone Thursday afternoon, and he seemed just fine fine to me. But by Friday afternoon, there's 12 people who are dead and more that are wounded. Why is that possible? Why is that happen? Because the ideal you is the one we present, but the real you is in trouble. And until we reach back and get a hold of that real you, and it gets brought to the forefront, because the problem with us is we're afraid if people really knew who we were, they wouldn't like us anyways. How many people have you known that you've labeled, you've said, they're like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of personality? How many times have you said that? I wonder how many times you've said, you know, that's a two-faced individual. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. How many times have you said, you don't want to see the worst of me? I'll tell you that right now. How many times have you heard that phrase used? We say, I'm not a morning person. You know, you, 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 you have no idea, but you're one of the very few people who've ever saw that side of me. See, we use phrases like that all the time. We call people that seem to act one way one time and act another way another time. We say they're emotional, they're irrational, they're moody. The reality is what we're seeing is the twins in operation. See, if you keep projecting the image that you're all right, then you're in more trouble than you imagine. See, because I'm here to tell you today that Jesus cannot bless your image. Jesus will not bless your image. Jesus did not die for your projected image, but he died for you and all of you. And the reality is until we accept that, we're going to live with this lie in our lives where we're wondering, what did I tell you last week? What did I say to you before? We're trying to remember all the charades that we played. One of you is in trouble. Jesus uh, said it very clearly that a house divided against itself cannot stand. You know that Jesus called you and I to stand. He needs you to stand. He requires that you stand. And he created you to stand. But if you're a house that's divided against itself, you cannot stand. If you're divided in your emotions, if you're divided in your mind, if you're divided in your thoughts, if you're divided in your goals, if you're divided in your marriage, a house divided against itself cannot stand, Jesus says. And I wonder how many of us are falling today because the real you has been suppressed for so long that you don't even know if you can get in touch with it. James said in James chapter 1, verse 8, a double-minded double man 
is unstable in all of his ways. A double-minded man, somebody who has two thoughts going at the same time. I'd like to say yes, but I think I'm going to say no. I'd like to go there with you, but I think I should stay here. I, I, I know I'm right, but you may be wrong. The reality is when you're double-minded, you are unstable in all your ways. You are wishy-washy. That's what James said about it. I wonder how much longer you're going to play the game and allow yourself to go through life missing out on what Jesus called you to be, and he called you to be one. He came back after eight days for Thomas because Thomas had been missing, and now Thomas was here. And Jesus wanted to make sure that Thomas would not live the rest of his life double-minded or divided. There's that scripture in Matthew chapter 18, and I'm almost done. In Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus says that I tell you the truth, if two of you will agree on earth upon anything, it shall be done. Jesus went on to say, where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I am there with you. You know that scripture, right? Matthew 18, verses 19 through 20. You've heard that before. I used to think for the longest time that it was, it was necessary to have two or three people outside myself to come into agreement. But now that I understand that there's these opposing forces, and now that I understand the ideal me and the real me, I, I wonder if, if, if the real victory isn't in if the two or three in me, if maybe they would come into agreement. You know, I'm talking about me, myself, and I. If those would come into agreement under the head of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then I wonder how much of the problem would be solved. That I need to come into agreement with myself and no longer live this wishy-washy life. See, you think you're blessed now. You have no idea how blessed you could be because only one of you is being blessed right now. But I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered the heart of any man the things which God has prepared for those whom he loves. God has some things prepared for you, but he can't split it between the two of you. He needs you to be one. He needs you to be one. Andy, would you come this morning? I'll just close this morning. I, thank you for allowing me just to rant and rave. But I did it for you. I hope you understand where I'm going with this. Do you ever remember the game charades? Did you ever play charades? Raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. You, you played charades, right? Yeah. Remember the game charades? Charades is an interesting game because uh, you get up in front of people you know, right? And, and you've got to act out something. And in the midst of acting out, um, you can't use any words, right? You can't say what you're doing. You're just trying to act out things. You're trying to, you're trying to show them you know, who you are, right? You're trying to, you're trying to do that. But if you say anything, you're disqualified. See, I wonder how much of that is what's happening with us. That I wonder how much of the charades we're playing. I wonder how much there's a game that's going on. Where we're trying to act something out, and in the midst of acting it out, we can't use words. See, we desperately want to tell someone what's going on in the real me, right? But if you continue to just act this thing out and hoping before the clock runs out that somebody will really know who, who you are and how you feel. Because when the clock reaches zero, your, your time is done. Your turn is over. And you're just going to go and set back down. It's Thomas. He's the guy that desperately wanted to die for Jesus, but he's the same guy that didn't understand who Jesus really was. It's Thomas, right? I mean, he wasn't there when Jesus came back from the dead and appeared the first time. Where was he? But now he's here the second time. And it was after eight days, Jesus said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to cut the flesh because it's out of control. I... I, I want you to be different. I want you to be one. Do you notice as you read your Bibles that the moment it happened for Thomas was the moment he touched Jesus? It's when he touched him. It's when he put his finger in the holes from the nails and his hand into his side. It was then that Thomas saw that this was my Lord 
in my God. You're the one Christ. You're the Messiah. It was in that moment. It's when he touched him. It's when he touched him because he realized then that Jesus had did all of this just for him. If this room cleared and you all went home and I was the only one here, Jesus would come back for me again and again and again until I got it together. If we all cleared this room and you were the only one left here, Jesus would come back for you because he knows what those closest to you have no idea. He knows the pain of what it's like to live the lie you've been living. He knows how much you hurt and he knows how much you've missed out on life. He knows how much you want so desperately to be whole and complete. He knows that you speak peace with your mouth, but there's hell in your heart. He knows you say you have faith, you tell everyone, but fear runs rampant in your mind, doesn't it? Do you understand you can't be a public success if there's private failure? When will we stop playing the games? When will we stop charading around and just get honest and get real because you said you were ready for it and bring this thing together? In Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You caught the first part. He said, whatever you bind here on earth, whatever you bring together, whatever you make whole and complete, whatever you reconcile here on earth, it will be reconciled. It will be whole. It will be complete. It will be bound in heaven. You got some work to do today. You got to get this thing together. You got to bring it together. God has plans for you, and He can't do it if you're divided. So I'm going to ask you to do something very quietly. Please, no, no, no moving around. You don't need to grab your Bible, your purse. But I want you to quietly stand. And when you stand, I want both of you to stand. Go ahead and stand. What I want us to do is something that takes great risk, okay? What I'm gonna ask you to do next is audacious. It's unorthodox. We've never done this in the history of our church, what I'm gonna do next. But I believe it's the only way that we're gonna get this done. If you don't know the person beside you, ask for permission first. And if they say no, respect it. But I want you to reach out and take the hand of someone near you. Just take their hand. Go ahead and do it right now. It was when Thomas touched Jesus that he got healed. He brought it together. You know, the disciples never returned to a locked room again. The disciples never lived in fear again. They were bold and they were confident because they were one in Christ. But it was when Thomas touched Jesus. And we don't have the physical Jesus here today. But could we possibly reach out and allow this mystical Jesus to be a part of this moment? Could we do that? Could you believe for a moment that the person whose hand you are holding is somebody who would die for you? Is it possible that we could believe the person whose hand you're holding could represent Christ to us? They're not our Messiah. They're not the Savior. But in this moment, let them be that for you. Because that person standing beside you is a miracle this morning. They're a miracle of God that they're not dead. There are people standing here this morning who've, who've been nailed to a cross before. They've been crucified. They've, they know what it's like to die. And there's others who are standing here who've got no skin in the game. You've been living the lie, the ideal you and the real you. But the person whose hand you're holding this morning May that be the representation of Christ that you need this morning. So what I want you to do is be the body of Christ. Bow your heads and begin to pray for the person whose hand you're holding right now. You pray for the real you in them. You pray for what they're up against. 
You begin to pray with more passion than you've ever prayed before because there's battles that they're facing, depression and anxiety, confusion and doubt and disappointment. Their person you're holding the hand with this morning has faced demons you can't even imagine. You pray right now that they'll become whole, that they'll become complete, that they'll be reconciled in themselves, no longer living two lives, the ideal you and the real you. They're going to come together. They're going to be bound in Jesus Christ, submitted to the power of His Holy Spirit. You pray for them right now as though their lives were in the balance. Oh God, would you make us one? One in our minds and one in our hearts. Oh God, for those hands that we are holding this morning, may they be encouraged today to know that they don't have to live the lie anymore. We accept them just the way they are. We don't need the charade. We don't need the flesh and bang. We, we just love them the way they are. Flaws and false. It's all right with us because guess what? We're the same way. But oh God, thank you that you died on the cross to set me free. Your blood was shed and you sent your spirit and you said if we'll confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you shall be Lord over all. And in that we claim today, Jesus, we are one in you, Christ. We are one in the body of Christ. We are united together. We are bound now, no longer divided. We shall stand. We are not double-minded and unstable, but we stand firm in Christ and Christ alone. Though the storm rages, we shall be still and know that you are God. We pray this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus and all those who believe in his ability to bind things together. You say amen and give God praise this morning. There are things that God is calling this church to do. There are things that God is preparing us to do in this community. And we cannot do them if we are divided. You need to be one. You need to know that when God speaks, you hear God's voice. You need to know that if he's going that way, we're going with him. You need that in your marriage right now. There are people right now that you've been living with somebody you don't even know. But today, you're going to know who they are because they got it together. There's young men and women here this morning who heard what I just shared. And they prayed that prayer. You prayed for them. How do we know that they're not the next Billy Graham? How do we know that they're not the next missionary that changes the world? How do we not know that they might be the one that solves and cures cancer forever? We just made that possible in the power of Jesus Christ because we helped them get it together. Oh, may we understand. All we got to do is come in his presence and be still. I know I've went over this morning. But you need to stay for just a few more minutes. And let us worship together and connect with the God who can give us rest and peace. Andy, would you lead us this morning? I will see you next Sunday morning. Thanks for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you at one of our Sunday morning services at 9 or 11 a.m.